Hi, welcome back to the shop. In today's video, we're going to check out the Big Tree Tech Pi version 2. Full disclosure, Big Tree Tech did send this to me for review, but they didn't pay me, no money exchange hands, and they don't get to see this video before I publish it. So as always, you could expect a full 100% honest review of this product. With that out of the way, let's get into it. Let's start by seeing what's in the box. Of course, you get your rubber ducky. Looks like the Wi-Fi antenna, a generously sized heat sink, a nice big tree tech sticker, some documentation, whatever that is. And the pie itself in an anti-static bag. Next, let's go over some features and specifications. I'm getting this information directly from the user manual that you could download from the Big Tree Tech CP2 GitHub, linked in the video description. For the CPU, it's got a quad core Cortex A55 at 1.8 gigahertz. It's got two gigabytes of DDR4 RAM. It's got onboard eMMC that's 32 gigabytes. More on that later. It's got DSi display support. So if you have a Pi display that will work directly with this, it has a CSI2 camera interface. It's got three USB 2.0 ports and one USB 3.0 port and a gigabit ethernet connection. It also has a PCI Express 2.1 by one that supports an M.2 2242 storage if you wanted to go that route and a micro SD slot as well. You also get a 3.5 millimeter audio jack, your 40 pin GPIO, HDMI 2.0 output that can do 480p to 4K 60 hertz, and it can be powered either by USB-C or 12 to 24 volts and directly to the board. For wireless connections, you get dual band Wi-Fi, so 2.4 or 5 gigahertz, and also Bluetooth 5.2. For the purpose of this test, I'm going to install this into my Two Trees SP5. This machine currently has a Pi 1.2 in it, so it should be a pretty straightforward swap out. First, I had to make a slight modification to the 3D file for the mounting bracket that I had originally devised for the Pi 1.2. It's as simple as changing the hole locations and repairing whatever geometry that might get broken during this process. Then it was off to the 3D printer. Before getting too far, we gotta get the heat sink onto this thing. It's as simple as a peel and stick. And you wanna stick it on the main CPU here and the chip closest to your DSi and CSi connections. You don't need it on the EMMC module. There it is. It looks like it doesn't quite overlap the, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that's the memory or GPU chip. Maybe it only needs to be on the main CPU chip, but it doesn't hurt to have it on both. It gives cooling for both. So um, I don't expect heat to transfer over to cause any issues, but uh, only one way to find out. Can't forget the Wi-Fi antenna. That was a bit more fiddly than I wanted it to be. The ground and positive connections on the new Pi are opposite of what it is on the old Pi. So if you are swapping from an old Pi to a new Pi, be mindful of that. And these GPIOs, this is for my accelerometer. Just a one-to-one -one swap. Because the pinout should be 
essentially the same. The antenna is just some sticky tape. So all you need to do is peel and stick. And I recommend putting it on the outside of the machine just to eliminate any chance of signal loss or blockage of the signal. All right, after some fiddliness, I got the new Pi installed. And while I was at it, I devised up a case to mount this Pi TFT50 so I could utilize the DSi display output for it so I could have a good functional display on this machine. Now let's start installing software onto the Pi. I'm going to utilize the built-in EMMC module, and I'm going to kind of go over how to do that. I've never done it before. I'm going to use the instructions that Big Tree Tech provides. And uh, if I could figure it out, well, anybody can figure it out using those instructions. So here we go. Installing the software on this was essentially the same process as the previous version Pi. Just go to the GitHub for the CB2 module, download the image file, install it on a micro SD card with a Raspberry Pi imager, and you're good to go. Now, one thing I really was curious about is the eMMC built-in storage. The instruction manual for it provides two different methods for installing onto the eMMC. I went for what I feel is a more simple option, doing it from an SD card. It was as simple as SSHing into the Pi with something like Putty, which is what I use, installing the SD card, running a few commands and scripts, and you're good to go. The nice thing is the instruction has pictures of what you will actually see, like screenshots of what you will see as you go through the process. I think that's a nice touch and really gives clarity to the whole process and makes it easier for the newcomers to this thing. Using the onboard storage has two big advantages that I could see. One, it frees up an SD card, and who doesn't like having extra storage laying around when you need it? And two, and this is the big one, you could set up your entire installation on that micro SD card until everything works perfectly fine, load in your configurations, get it all working just fine, everything. Then you could load that data straight to the eMMC and then you have that SD card still unchanged and that could be a good hard backup of all of your data, all your configurations that you have created. This is a big, big deal for some people I could see. If something ever happens, it gets corrupted, power loss, something like that, this does happen. You have a good backup that you could just plug in, reflash the eMMC and you're good to go. No fiddling around with trying to find your configs and all that kind of stuff. You have a hard copy that you can keep stored somewhere. The rest of the installation was pretty straightforward from here. A nice thing is that the image that is provided already has Clippo pre-installed with all its requisites. So it was a matter of just opening up the web interface, which happens to be main sale that they have pre-installed on it, which is what I predominantly use, so bonus, and loading in my configuration files for this machine. I also went ahead and installed Kiowa and some scripts that I use for my particular installation, like Clipper Backup and Camp. All of this went just about as well as you could expect. Now, since I had previously had Clipper installed on this machine, I didn't have to fiddle around with generating a firmware file for the MCU or the mainboard on here. So that saved me a little bit of time. I will say that this didn't go without its fair share of hiccups. One of them being that I couldn't get the Wi-Fi to connect originally. After some fiddling around with it and trying to figure it out, I realized that my antenna placement was abysmal. Apparently, unlike the previous version of Pi, you cannot stick the antenna directly to the metal case of the machine. So all I had to do was move it up a couple inches to the polycarbonate plexiglass side of my pseudo enclosure here, and then it was just fine. Second one being mainly my fault is that the display didn't come on right away. Actually, the whole Pi and display combo wouldn't power up. I did notice pretty quickly that the ribbon cable for the display got mighty hot mighty quick and I was able to power it off before any damage, major damage could have been done. And I figured out that hi, silly me, had the ribbon cable plugged into the CSI port instead of the DSI port. Apparently you can't do that. Um, so uh, like I said, my fault, I wasn't paying enough attention to the instructions or the how they have a picture of the layout of the board, the picture for those two connectors are super zoomed in. They're right next to each other and the lettering, the labeling on the silk screen, it's kind of hard to read. It's very small letters and it's kind of deep in there. So um, again, my fault, I wasn't paying attention. I was able to put it in the right spot and luckily no damage was done. Turn it back on, everything came on, screen came on. So good to go there. The last hiccup being that my accelerometer it is a big tree tech adxl but it's the version one so it uses an spi interface um, it is not recognized by the pi and according to their website it doesn't have an spi interface but on the um, environment uh, configuration there is some spi options but they're for overlays i don't know what they mean i couldn't find any specific spi 
plug in our port and I expected them to go through the GPIO like on the previous version Pi or on an actual Raspberry Pi. Um, so I've emailed them about this and hopefully they will get back to me soon with a solution. Um, and when they do, I will put that solution in the video description. So for now, I just had to disable the ADXL in my printer configuration. Luckily, I already had my input shaper values already tuned. So I just, you know, leave those in, uh, comment out the ADXL stuff and everything came up just fine. And the printer functions perfectly fine after that. So now it's time to actually test it, do a test print, see how it works. I'm sure it'll be fine, but hey, we have to do this, right? We're a 3D printing channel. We have to 3D print something in this video. So I'm gonna load up a spool of filament. I think I have some, uh, oh, I have some copper PLA that looks pretty snazzy. So I'm gonna get that loaded up and get uh, like a Benchy or something started. And then while that goes, I'm gonna talk about pros and cons and uh, a few other thoughts that I had. So we'll be right back. All right, final thoughts here. Let's talk about pricing. This thing comes in right now for $50 US from the Big Tree Tech website. I uh, currently can't find it on Amazon or any other retailers, but I figure here pretty soon they will start making their way over to other stores to buy it from. Um, so this is starting to, in my opinion, move its way a little bit outside of the more budget range for a pie alternatives, although there are still more expensive options out there that I would feel aren't quite as capable as this, um, and it's still not touching quite the price of a Raspberry Pi 4 or 5 right now, if you could still find them. But if this is within your price range, I think it's well worth it. The previous version is still available, uh, both on Amazon and Big Tree Tech directly, and you could find it between $30 and $35 US. Um, so do I believe that there is a $20 to $15 difference or improvement in, say, performance and features? Um, that's more a subjective thing for me. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I like having the multiple storage options. I like the EMMC and uh, what I talked about with the way of doing a hard backup on an SD card, which is nice. I also like having multiple display outputs that gives you more options for displays out there um, if you see fit. It does have faster hardware, faster RAM, faster CPU, and all that kind of thing. I don't know if that will be apparent in your experience. I think your mileage may vary with that if you do happen to go this route. The dual band Wi-Fi is a nice touch for those that like to use either 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. For those that may want to use this for something other than 3D printing, it definitely gives you more performance and more options for things like home security, home assistant, uh, server for storage, or any other Pi project you might see fit. And although you can't install the Pi OS to it, it does come with a fully functional Linux-based operating system that you could work with. There are a few changes that I could recommend to Big Tree Tech that I don't feel would be too hard to implement into future revisions. One of them being having more clear instructions on the placement and orientation of the Wi-Fi antenna. Another one being placement of the heatsink. I know they're recycling the same heatsink from the previous version, which is fine, but there's nothing that tells you exactly what chip it's supposed to be over and if there's any overlap on any of them that needs to be there. Having some sort of a, uh, like a picture on the instruction manual or like a silk screen outline that shows you know, where it's supposed to go will be very helpful. Also, the CSI and DSI ports on the board are very close to each other and can be confused pretty easily if you're not really paying attention. I know I'm not the only one that could run into this. There was a way you could either color code them or have, again, some sort of silk screen outline um, in various colors or different colors. And then note that in the instructions would make it a little bit easier to follow and less confusing for those in the future. Another small thing would be able to have an option for customizing the display splash screen, the startup thing. Um, in the previous version, it had a nice big tree tech. It looked actually quite nice and I liked it. This one is some generic, uh, it's the name of the actual software, a, a not Debian, but a Adian. I'll, I'll show it on the screen here. Um, it's a little generic looking and if you could have uh, some sort of a custom option, you know, load in your own bitmap image, that would be really nice. I found the bitmap image for it, but it, it's not an image. It's some random strings of code. And I don't know how that is. It's converted to that. So uh, having some sort of a way to be able to do that custom would be great. And my biggest gripe would be the external Wi-Fi antenna. If there was a way you could have the board to not have to have an external antenna at all. That would be a huge improvement. It would eliminate a lot of confusion on where the antenna is supposed to go. Also, the antenna you provide it's a little flimsy. The wire for it seems a little bit fragile. The way it's just kind of soldered on to a stick on sheet, in my opinion, is a little cheesy. Also, the connector that is used is 
very, very small and quite difficult to plug into the board and potentially could be very easy to damage. My overall opinion is that this is a great product. It's a good improvement over the previous version. It still, I think, is a reasonable price, although stepping out of that budget range, like I said. One thing I did forget to mention is that if you have something like the Pad 7 or one of the Manta boards from Big Tree Tech, it will be upgradable to the CB2 module. Um, they don't have a heatsink option quite available for it, especially for the Pad 7 yet. They said they're working on it. Um, but on their website, it also says you don't need the heatsink for the CB2. So I don't know. Um, we're going to have to wait for more clarity from Big Tree Tech on that. But if you are working on a build or you've just gotten a, a, a board for the CB1 and then, oh no, they've just released this new faster chip, um, you're in luck because the new chip will work on as an upgrade on the um, current Manta boards and Big Tree Tech Pad 7. And I do wonder if in the future Big Tree Tech will ship the Pad 7 with the CB2 chip pre-installed or have it as like an upgradable option or something like that. I don't know. I'm just speculating. I think that would be pretty cool though. Um, having it as an option, like, you know, pay, what is it, like 120 bucks for it with CB1 and then, oh, like 100 and... 30 or 40 or whatever for the cb2 um so and then the price for the axle of the cb2 is ten dollars less 39.99 on the big tree tech website and that just about covers it i want to thank big tree tech again for sending me this out for review um, all the instructions and documentation i used i will have in the video description as well as links to where you can buy this yourself from big tree tech if you haven't yet please hit that like button subscribe and leave some comments. Um, I know this wasn't an in-depth uh, how-to on how to install it and how to do the software. I plan on doing that in the future, especially the EMMC process. It was pretty nifty and pretty cool how it worked. Um, I will do a full form tutorial video on that soon. Um, but other than that, I think we're done here. And I want to thank you all for watching. Have a nice day and happy food.